On your Friday episode of Locked On Raptors, it's the bloodiest, goriest piece of content since the second last episode of Game of Thrones. That's right. We're taking up our preseason bold predictions. You are Locked On Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on? And welcome to another episode of Locked On Raptors, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It is Friday, April the 12th, and I'm your host, Sean Woodley. I've been covering the Toronto Raptors now for 10 seasons on various platforms. You can find all my work over on the Hell website at Woodley Sean. You can find the show on Instagram at Locked On Raptors. And of course, you can join us in the Locked On Raptors Discord server. The link is in the description of the podcast. Come hang out. It's a lovely place to come talk ball amongst friends, talking about the draft, talking about, uh, I guess, the Raptors sometimes. The playoffs are coming. We'll talk about real basketball. It's going to be awesome. We would love to see you in there. Come be part of our listener community. Of course, you can find the show and support it on your favorite podcast apps by following, subscribing, rating, reviewing, all that good stuff. Uh, get that audio feed of the show going. You can also find us on YouTube and go subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell and get a push notification every single time the show is about to premiere or go live. Much appreciated either way. However you support the show, you're all the very best. All right. On today's show, it's a bloodbath. We are going to be taking a look at the preseason bold predictions laid out by myself and today's guest uh, the day the season began. Look, some of it we got pretty right. Other things we got extraordinarily wrong. Let's get to it. We'll bring him in from Pound the Rock and the Score. It's our pal Joseph Cacharo. Joey Cash, how are you, man? I'm doing well right now, but that's because we haven't actually started getting into this. I'm going to be honest with you, Sean. Based on what I remember from our bold predictions, and I will remind the people watching and listening to this, they were supposed to be bold, all right? <laughs> yes. I will say, if what I remember is correct and that we were grossly incorrect, I think it would be a more painless exercise for us to stand outside of Scotiabank Arena and let fans kick us in the balls than it will be. <laughs> to go through this episode. Uh, I mean, the entire season has been just the Raptors franchise kicking us in the balls. So it Fair can't enough. be any worse than that, right? Uh, yeah, that the we'll we'll uh we'll get into it. We'll start with some stuff we got like pretty close to right, if not bang on. That's fun. And then as we descend through the rest of the podcast, we'll just get wronger and wronger and wronger, if that's even a word, and if I'm pronouncing it correctly, I don't even know. Let's start, though. We'll go with my first bold prediction here off the top. And this one, I'm going to say I nailed. Hit it out of the park like Davis Schneider. Here we go. Bold prediction number one. The Raptors lead the NBA in transition frequency and set a franchise record for transition frequency while flirting with the Warriors' all-time transition frequency record, all-time being back to 2003-04, which is uh, the database for Clean the Glass, who uh, keeps track of transition frequency. And the result, not so bad. Raptors finished number one in transition frequency. They're going to finish there. They're like a full percentage point ahead of number two at 17.8%. It's the first time they will lead the league in franchise history in transition frequency, and it's the fourth highest single season transition frequency number they've ever had. But because relative to the, to the league, they finished first for the first time ever, I'm saying I got this right. It's a franchise record for highest finish in transition frequency. Joey Cash, are you giving me this one, or did I uh, woefully get this one wrong because of the slight semantics at the end? And uh, overall thoughts on the Raptors' transition attack, I suppose, on top of that. I'll give it to you because, again, like I said, when you're doing bold predictions, I feel like if you're even in the ballpark, you're – you get some credit. So I'll definitely give that one to you. And um, I mean, you could take it even further, even though they're not necessarily related, but like even the assist percentage mark, like if someone had kind of beginning of the season mm -hmm. said, this is going to be the highest assist percentage team in Raptors history or something like that. Um, you know, that would have been a good bold prediction. That would have been, I think, true. Uh, something we could have uh, really got yeah. used in, in the last night, Why didn't one of us <laughs> say that? Um, but no, I think – it kind of went the way we thought it would, where this team was going to struggle to score, struggle to create, <clears throat> excuse me, scr struggle to create advantages, mm -hmm. um, struggle to create good looks for good shooters because there weren't a lot of good shooters on this team anyway. And they actually created a lot of good looks for bad shooters throughout the year. 
Um, and then, yeah, I mean, it just got even worse once the trades happened and then once the injuries happened. Like this team, watching this team try to create advantages and create good quality, efficient offense was, you know, akin to having your teeth pulled out. <laughs> you know, it, it was bad. It was bad. I don't, know if, I don't know if I go that far. Like, I think I the mean, it process the bottom, offensively. Bottom seven, bottom eight in offensive efficiency. I mean, yeah, like the results were bad. But I do think like the process of creating the looks was generally pretty decent, especially compared to like what the offense looked like last season. Like they played Darko ball and stuck with it throughout the year, um, which is honestly why I'm a little bit surprised they lean so hard into the transition thing, especially after the midseason trades where the offense did perk up a little bit there for the window between the deadline and Scotty Barnes going out, obviously a very short you know, and, and limited sample size there. Um, and so maybe it makes sense they reverted back to their transition ways. But, you know, I, my sort of thinking in making this prediction was they're – and they got to it in a way that it, like, it just did not line up with my thinking at all. I, I thought the starting five with Dennis Schroeder was going to be really bad offensively, but it was going to be an absolute behemoth on defense. And I thought they'd turn that into a ton of runouts off of rebounds, turnovers, forced, et cetera. And they would have to do that because the half-court offense would be so grim. And look, the half-court offense for that lineup was extremely grim – they were also bad at defense too. And so uh, they didn't quite turn stops and rebounds into points the other way. They just, I think, kind of made it a, a, a point of emphasis to just run no matter what, even off of makes and stuff like that as well. Obviously, they did it off of misses too. But uh, I, I'm surprised that they held up as the number one transition team. And I'm curious to see what happens next season as, you know, hopefully the offense is a little bit more smooth and crisp and has some more creation with Emmanuel quickly. They'll also probably still be a very good transition team because Scotty Barnes is extremely good at running the break. Uh, RJ Barrett is a bull in transition now as well. Uh, and they have the pieces to be pretty good there, even with Pascal Siakam no longer around. Also, they were number one in the league in transition points added per 100 possessions as well. They weren't just running a lot. They were actually converting, which is the thing we talked about on this episode on the start of the season as well, where they just couldn't convert their transition opportunities last season. A big change there. Uh, I, I mentioned Scotty Barnes, Joey Cash. Let's get to your first bold prediction, which was yeah. Scotty Barnes wins most improved player. The result, he didn't win most improved player, wasn't eligible because hasn't played enough games. But I would argue you kind of got this one right in the spirit of it, in that he played so well. He had a leap that I think was worthy of most improved, improved player consideration had he gotten to the threshold of 65 games. Maybe he wins it, maybe he doesn't. It felt like maybe he wasn't in the conversation as much as he should have been, just sort of anecdotally speaking. But uh, how are you feeling about your Scotty Barnes MIP pick from before the season? You got to be feeling pretty all right about that one. Oh, yeah. I'm giving myself that one. It's like what I think. <laughs> when you're talking bold predictions, if you're, if, if, I said if you're in the ballpark. I mean, this is, I was like within 30 feet of this one. It, it, <laughs> he didn't win most improved player. Even if he had qualified, he probably doesn't win it because mm -hmm. I think Tyrese Maxey probably still ends up winning it, even though, did he end up playing 65 games? I think you can see you get there, yeah. Yeah. Um, but like you said, he had an MIP caliber season. With that jump he took from the sophomore slump, whatever you want to call it, sophomore stagnation, to what he was in his third year, that is a most improved player caliber season, caliber leap. And I think, you know, just looking at it big picture-wise, the most important development this season was – that the Raptors, I think, found out the sophomore season was the blip when it comes to mm -hmm. Scott Barnes. And like who sure. we saw win rookie of the year and the guy they were excited about when they drafted him fourth overall at the time, controversially so, <laughs> above Jalen Suggs, is the, this guy. Like what he did in year three was pretty remarkable on both ends of the court. The leap he took as a defender, what he did offensively as a creator, like all of that. And I think what you're seeing now is Scotty Barnes – developing into the kind of player not so much as a scorer because I think he's going to be a different kind of star and like superstar you know all things considered mm -hmm. in that I don't think he's going to be like the scoring superstar most people consider when they think of the word superstar right he might never average 25 plus a game he's never going to be that kind of maybe go to one number one scorer on championship team type superstar but sure. as an all-around player they're just aren't many guys who can do the things Scotty Barnes can do in every facet of the game in the league right now. 
And there are very few who have been able to do what he did as an all-around player at his age and experience in NBA history. Mm -hmm. So again, I, you know, I made the joke about it feeling like our, yeah, watching his team try to create offense is like having your teeth pulled out without a sedative. We know about the trades, you know about how bad the Siakam trade was, you know about how painful it was to watch his team with all the injuries and the skeleton crew they had out there the last month losing 15 straight. But again, the most important development of this season for the Raptors I mean, all the negativity was that Scotty Barnes is that guy. And if Scotty Barnes is in the lineup and part of this build going forward, which he obviously will be, there is something to look forward to. There is, you know, an upward trajectory to look towards, especially with, you know, quickly and Barrett now in the fold as well and some of the things they can do. Obviously, mm -hmm. they're far from done. And I'm not saying like, oh, they're going to be competitive next year. But Scotty is special. Yep. And we saw that this year. And, and, that's a huge development for sure. And I would even go uh, one further than you just kind of given it to yourself because he was in the ballpark for most improved. I think if you just like go on number of things improved at Scotty Barnes improved at the most things of any of the guys in the most improved conversation because of the defensive stuff, because of just like every little element of his game, the three point shooting, obviously, which yeah, tailed off after the Pascal Siakam departure, but uh, for the most part was like blazing hot for, for a good long stretch of this season when he was in the lineup. Like he just got better at everything, which you don't see. That's not supposed to happen, but he did. The defensive jump, you know, the work he does as a low man, a, a shot blocker, an event creator on defense is pretty remarkable considering where he was as a second year player. Um, you know, I'm pretty bullish on what he can do as a low man going forward. We'll see about the on ball stuff. There were moments here and there, the game against Steph, where he kind of shadowed him and, and performed well. That was one of the highlights there. But for the most part, he's sort of a backline, uh, sort of mess things up kind of defender. And that just was not a thing for him in year two. It was a little bit misshapen. It was just, you know, he didn't seem to have an idea. He got better at everything. When you get better at everything, you should be in the conversation conversation for most improved. And had he played the requ requisite amount of games, I think like a top three finish, maybe that would have been voted for or not. We never know. The voters are weird on this one, but I think certainly deserved to be a top three finisher in that award. Um, and I don't think that's just like hometown bias talking either. The dude got better at everything. And it's uh, it's hard to do that, especially considering the context of the team around him changing like 15 different times over the course of the year. Uh, Cash, we're going to come back on the other side, get into our second bold predictions, and it's all downhill from here. We'll do that coming up in just one sec. Today's show is brought to you by Stitch Fix. You know, it's the summertime. Maybe you got a new wardrobe you're trying to tap into, get some new clothes for the nice, warm weather, and there's nothing better than finding a really great outfit. You know what's even better than that, though, is finding it without having to go to a store to try stuff on. With Stitch Fix, you get a stylist who understands your style, size, and budget. They do all the shopping for you. It's the easiest way to update your wardrobe this season. Easily upgrade your wardrobe this year with a professional stylist that helps you find the new on-trend favorites that will work for you. All you got to do is give your stylist your size, your style, and your budget preferences. You order boxes when you want, how you want, no subscription required, and they send five just-for-you pieces, plus outfit recommendations and pro styling advice. You keep what works, you send back the rest. It's that simple. I hate going into changing rooms. It's the worst thing in the world. So cut that part out when you're shopping for new clothes this spring season. And you can just send it back so easily. Shipping's return exchanges always free if you don't like it. Style that makes you feel as good as you look. Get started today at stitchfix.com slash locked on. That's stitchfix.com slash locked on. Stitchfix.com slash locked on. Today's show is also brought to you by our friends over at eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find the exact part for what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit only available to U.S. customers. Back at it here, segment two with Joseph Kashar from The Score and Pound the Rock, the single best NBA podcast there is. 
uh, here taking up our bold predictions from the start of the season, October the 24th, 2023, which was only five or so months ago, six or so months ago. But man, oh man, does it feel like an eternity in Toronto Raptors yeah. time. <laughs> um, Cash, let's get to it. Our second bold predictions. Let's get to mine here. Uh, I was pretty optimistic going into the year that Pascal Siakam was not going to get traded. That was thing wrong, the number one. Thing thing wrong, number one. Thing one that I was wrong about. I don't know what I'm saying. I'm still upset about the Pascal Siakam yeah, trade. Of course, he Raptors did get Raptors didn't traded. know what they were doing in that trade. <sighs> yep. Tell me about it. Uh, they should have done my trade. So my bold prediction was if Pascal Siakam gets traded... It's going to the Golden State Warriors for Chris Paul, Jonathan Kaminga, and Trace Jackson Davis. The result of this prediction, Siakam gets traded to the Indiana Pacers for a poo-poo platter. Uh, I was wrong on this one. I wish I were right on this one. It'd be pretty tight to have Kaminga and Trace Jackson Davis on this team right now, let alone the sage wisdom of one Chris Paul. Joey Cash, uh, can you console me for being so, so wrong about this one? It felt like it was pretty good at it. Like the shot felt good right at the time. Well, I mean, I guess very minor consolation would be that even if they had made that trade, they probably wouldn't have the sage wisdom of Chris Paul because he would have got <laughs> bought out and all, in all true, likelihood. <laughs> but they would have had Trace Jackson Davis and Jonathan Kaminga. And mm -hmm. it would have been a lot better than what they got. And I will keep coming back to this until I'm proven wrong, which I won't be because that trade was a disaster. But like they botched that situation so mammothly. Mm -hmm. like, you can't trade a player as good as Pascal Siak. Let me rephrase that because it, it, it does happen. You can't have all the indicators pointing towards – we're going to trade this guy or this guy needs to be traded or whatever. It, it's just the end of this era and something needs to be done and something needs to give like every indicator pointing towards this guy's probably going to get traded. You can't trade that guy when he's that good and get the crap they got back. Mm -hmm. Like they, as I said at the time, clearly did not believe any longer that Pascal Siakam was going to be worth the value of a max contract going forward for the next Which three to five years. Thing so, wrong number one for the Raptors. Right. And that's <laughs> and that's fine. Like, even if that's their opinion, and I, I do understand it. I understand why a non-shooting power forward is the kind of guy that teams might view as like, ah, oh, we don't know how well he's going to age into his early 30s and whether he's going to be worth the value of a max contract. I get that. Sure. I don't necessarily agree with it in the case of Pascal Siakam, but I can at least understand that reasoning. Mm -hmm. But again, they clearly thought that about Pascal or else they would have just given him the max that he was worth, especially when he did not qualify for the Supermax. Like once he didn't qualify for that Supermax to me, it was, okay, he is now, what he's eligible for now is something much more in line with his value, which the Supermax would not have been. And they still didn't max him up. Mm -hmm. So again, they clearly didn't think he was going to be worth that. They knew he was going into a contract year. They knew they were going into a year that they felt was going to be more about starting to build around Scotty Barnes. And they knew they were going into that year with a new coach. They were empowering to implement a system that was going to take touches and opportunities and finishing opportunities away from Pascal Siakam. And yes, it would perhaps make him more efficient, but like his numbers are going to go down. His overall effectiveness in this system was going to go down at least somewhat. And you add in all those factors. And for them to not trade him going into that season, yet trade him months into it for whatever the hell they got from Indiana. Like, it was just such a clown show from a front office that even if you're down on them over the last few years, would have I would have never in my wildest dreams said they would handle a situation like a clown show. <laughs> but that's what they did in this Siakam situation. And look, yeah. full credit, the OG trade it turned out amazing. Incredible. But... I don't care how much of a homer anyone is. No one can look at me with a straight face and say they did anything but botch the Pascal Siakam situation. 10,000%, man. Uh, I could not agree more. You're echoing many sentiments I've had on this show. Uh, and speaking of the OG trade, that trade was so good, in fact, that it uh, set the team up with a group of players 
around Pascal Siakam that all of a sudden kind of made some sense because, wow, we have like a pull-up shooting guard now to help space things. And uh, RJ Barrett's like hitting 40% of his threes. Is that going to hold up? Maybe not. We're seeing some regression of late. Uh, but still, uh, there was something there, and yet they were still so telegraphed in their decision, as you just uh, very astutely laid out, that they moved him anyway for uh, not Jonathan Kaminga, Trace Jackson Davis, and Chris Paul. Uh, let's get to your number two bull prediction here. Uh, this one, uh, tough. This is where things get hard for Joey Cash. Your prediction before the season was Dennis Schroeder averages more assists per game than Fred Van Vliet. And uh, the result, Dennis Schroeder, 6.1 assists a game as a Raptor. Dropped a little bit since he went to the Nets, but we'll go with the Raptors total just to juice it up a little bit. 6.1 assists. Fred Van Vliet, 8.1 dimes a game for the Houston Rockets. Uh, Joey Cash, I have to ask you, why are you also one of these Fred haters out there, man? What's going on here? Uh, not at all a Fred hater. <laughs> Definitely believe you're, you're not posting really problematic things in YouTube comment sections about Fred, really? Because this is the behavior of someone who would be doing that. No, definitely not. Definitely not. But uh, listen, I I came into the year saying it was a massive downgrade to go from Fred Van, Fred Van Vliet to Dennis Schroeder. Mm -hmm. I thought the Raptors would be worse because of it. I, I don't think Dennis Schroeder is in the ballpark of player Fred Van Vliet is as an overall basketball player in the NBA. Mm -hmm. But again, we were, you know, the, the directive was to be bold. And I looked at how the Raptors wanted to play in Darko's system. Mm -hmm. The assist numbers were going to go up. Dennis Schroeder was going to kind of be at the head of that. I figured Fred in Houston would maybe, you know, look for his shot a little more. I, I thought he would still average a good amount of assists, but I really thought it would end up being maybe like a, a close race where Schroeder in Toronto's system, even if maybe for a bad team, would sure. be something more like closer to seven and Fred would be in the sixes. Obviously ended up wrong. I still stand by it as a bold prediction. Like, I don't regret making it too much. I I, I thought no. it fit the bill. But, uh, yeah, it just didn't turn out that way, you know? It's, it's Yeah, I mean. It was Dennis asking Schroeder. a lot of Dennis Schroeder. Look, man, the Raptors asked a lot of Dennis Schroeder to start the season. There's uh, no doubt about it. And, look, I mean, there was a time where I think he was ahead of Fred. I think we might have actually, like, exchanged a text, like, three weeks into the season. And you were like, keep an eye out. It's looking. It's yeah. looking like it might happen. And say, so yeah, it was like a good, like, first month of the season. Yeah. And then that starting five uh, completely fell into complete disarray as OG quiet quit and the team had made no sense. And Dennis took a little too much liberty uh, upon himself to go and save the offense a bunch, which is not a thing Dennis Schroeder is known for. Um, so, yeah, I, I, look, I think both of ours here were, I think, pretty like reasonable bold predictions to get wrong. We'll come back on the other side, Joe, and get to two bold predictions that we got incredibly wrong, and we simply must be culpable for it. We have to be accountable to you, the listeners. We will do that coming up in just one segment. It, it is it, just one second, second in the final segment. My goodness, I'm already getting upset. Uh, we'll get to it in a sec. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel, the single best place to go and wager on sports, the number one sports book in North America. It's playoff time in the NBA and NHL. Baseball's in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get 150 bucks in bonus bets guaranteed. That's 150 bucks in bonus bets, win or lose, just by making a bet. That is pretty sweet. You can bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on an app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. Uh, of course, right now you got the baseball season kicking back up. The Blue Jays have won two home games, which means I am fully back in on the Blue Jays are going all the way. And so you can join me there too and you know put a little money on a futures bet on the Blue Jays winning the World Series. That won't get you wrong. We're in the season of bold predictions in baseball. Make yourself a bold prediction by throwing some money down on a long futures bet. Why not? What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sports back and proud sports book and proud partner of the Locked On Podcast Network. Wrapping things up here with Joey Cash, Joseph Chuck. Joe, oh my God, I can't talk today, man. Oh, just, just talking about that Siakam trade just rattled you. 
You ruined me. Yeah, it's also the second podcast I've recorded today. Peek, peek behind the curtain. We're recording ahead of time for Friday, uh, and so my brain is fried. We'll just chalk it up to that. Uh, my brain is too full of Javon Freeman Liberty tape uh, from earlier in the day talking, and so yeah, that, that's why I can't speak the words good. That's it. Never happens on this podcast where I can't speak the words good. Right? I'm always good at that. Um, let's get to it. Our final bold predictions, and uh, this is where you know, avert your eyes parental discretion uh and all that good stuff <sighs> bull prediction number three for me grady dick and jayla mcdaniels would be the raptors best on off court two-man duo what was i thinking with this man i i broke the number one rule which is always understand rookies are bad you don't win minutes with rookies on the floor i was just like i don't care grady dick can shoot we haven't had that in ages on this team he's gonna be the best guy on the floor whoo Awful. Jalen McDaniels, I had hope. The world seemed to have hope. John Hollinger called him like the best value signing of the offseason. I was buying it, was drinking the Kool-Aid, and uh, boy, oh boy, was I proven wrong on that. Not only were they not the number one two-man duo for the Toronto Raptors, they sported a minus 20.3 net rating when they shared the floor with one another in just 245 possessions. Not exactly a staple wing duo like I thought they might be. Uh, they were in the first percentile among all lineups in uh, overall net rating. The zeroth percentile in offensive rating at 93.1 when they were on the floor together. And of 250 Raptors two-man duos to play any minutes together, they were 167th best. I was so wrong here. What the hell was I thinking, Cash? I genuinely don't know. <laughs> this is... <laughs> Even when, when we started this and, and right before we started recording, you were asking like if I remember if I went back and checked. And I said, no, like I remember some of them. I don't remember all mm -hmm. of them. This was one of the ones I remember because I remember it being so hyper specific <laughs> and being at the time being like, look, I love it. It's a bold prediction, mm -hmm. but it was like so hyper specific. And then, yeah, I mean, rookie, even rookies that end up being good NBA players often are net negatives as rookies. And it's like a universal truth that yeah. I fully believe. I'm known as the guy in the Lockdown Raptors Discord who hates all rookies and young players. I was just like out of my mind on this one. Yeah, it, it was definitely a little out there. And, you know, Jalen McDaniels is just uh, – it's rough to watch. So, look, I in the end, I think you could have said they'd be the best two-man duo in the 905, and that probably still would have been wrong. Like, I don't know <laughs> if they would have been the best two-man lineup in, on, a nine, uh, on a G League team. Yeah. I, I commend you. I applaud you for going out there for a bold, bold prediction episode. But yeah, I mean, what, it was bad. It was, it was bad. It's all right. I'll be right next year when I predict Dick and McDaniels to be the best on court wing duo for the Raptors when it's uh, Jaden McDaniels that they've traded for after the Wolves are too expensive and have to move on from their highly prized wing who would fit perfectly on the Toronto Raptors. Unfortunately, I think it's a you know a bigger, starrier name that'll be the the odd man out in Minnesota when they decide they're too expensive. You say this, but Carl Anthony Towns is going to come back. He's going to carry the team to two playoff wins against the Nuggets in round two or three or whatever it is. It's going to be the hardest series the Nuggets have ever played. They're not going to be able to quit Carl Anthony Towns, much like I can't quit Carl Anthony Towns. And Jaden McDaniels and Grady Dick are going to tear up the league next year please. Uh, all right. I've eaten a hell, an ample helping of crow. Yum, yum, yum. Now it's time for your turn. Your third bowl prediction before the season, Joey Cash. The Toronto Raptors will finish third in the Atlantic division. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. This went not very well. Do you have an explanation for yourself? Absolutely not. I will take my, <laughs> I will take my crow with a healthy serving of Pomodoro sauce on top. And, uh, <laughs> Gladly eat it because that was, yeah, that was, woof, that was bad. Um, I remember at the time saying, I believe, I said, well, they'd finish ahead of the Nets. And then the bold prediction was like, oh, they're going to somehow finish ahead of one of the Knicks or Sixers. And like, I mm -hmm. honestly don't know what I was smoking. I don't know if it was like, <laughs> I was out uh, one of them. There's going to be an injury, like Embiid's going to miss 60 games or something. Although if that would have happened, I still don't know if the Raptors would have finished ahead of Philly. I don't know, man. Philly's like, pretty bad without Embiid. <laughs> yeah, fair. The Knicks brought back 
the exact same eight man rotation that made the second round of the playoffs and added was it Di Vincenzo that they added? He wasn't there. Yeah, last year, right? yeah. yeah. They they yeah. brought back the same eight man rotation that made the second round the year before and added Di Vincenzo. Now obviously they made moves throughout the season, but still, even mm -hmm. that roster they started the lineup with, like the Raptors pretty much had no chance of finishing ahead of them. Although, you know, it's weird to say that because if you if you go back to October when Pascal Siakam and OG and OB were both on this team, and mm -hmm. I was expecting Scotty Barnes to be the most improved player, they were like one of the most improved players in the league. I don't think it was that crazy to expect they could have topped out like in the mid 40s for wins. Again, topped out. Yeah, mm -hmm. their ceiling, but still, I do think their ceiling could have been like a mid 40s win team that was like fighting for the you know the higher end of the play in. And if something had gone wrong with one of Philly or New York, like it could have happened. But again, there's a lot of ifs going on there. You're talking about one team hitting its ceiling and another team hitting its floor. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know I've said it 14 times already on today's episode, but it was a bold prediction. That was <laughs> I was trying to be bold and I was grossly incorrect. And again, I will eat that crow with. Yeah. Um, so it was bad. It, tough one, man. I'm going mean, to say for myself. Listening back to this episode in question uh, today in preparation for this podcast, which uh, I never listened to the podcast anymore. I used to back when I was like, I'm going to listen and get better. Now I just accept that I'm bad. Uh, but I did listen back to this episode. And uh, it, 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 was, it was it was just a nice little like, ooh, Emmanuel quickly is going to have more of a role on the Knicks. And it just like touched my heart. It's, he's going to have more of a role, but not for the Knicks. And that's very exciting uh, yeah. that he's doing that with the Raptors now. Um, but yeah, other than that, just uh, just wrong all over the place, man. It was a tough go for us on these final predictions. I think we went real bold uh, trying to like level up, and uh, we got burnt for it. Sorry, well, I cut you off. No, I was going to say, I mean, I'll give you a 2024-25 bold prediction right now. And that's that Emmanuel quickly is going to finish top five in most improved player. Oh, you already took my he's going to win most improved yeah, I, player listen, prediction I, from next season. <laughs> I said to Wolf on Joe Wolf. I, I mean, I'm sure listeners on your show know who Joe Wolf on is, my colleague oh, yeah. at the score and co-host the Pound the Rock. But I said to Wolf on maybe it was like a few weeks after that trade, and we were in the uh, 600 level, like media gondola at Scotiabank mm -hmm. Arena. And I said to him, like, give me, give me Emmanuel quickly 2025 most improved player odds. Because like I think I think like he is the type of player and his increased offensive role will be the type of increase that when you blend it together and the way his numbers are going to go, like that, that's the exact tailor-made type of player that, that ends up in that conversation. And I know, again, this might just come off kind of homerish because I was like, well, I made the same prediction for Scotty Barnes last year, but mm -hmm. I, I think things are lining up for quickly to be in that discussion next year. And uh, I think it can be really fun to watch his devel development with the Raptors. A big part of winning most improved player is like expanded opportunity. And he's going to be, I think, the pretty clear cut number two guy and lead creator on a team. And the early returns from just the last little stretch with the Raptors have been incredibly promising. I'm super in on the quickly experience, the playmaking jump he's made and just sort of seamlessly stepping into like high end ball security with also very good creation for others. Uh, pretty tough stuff to do with this like misshapen roster he's been playing with uh, in a you know a midseason sort of joining a team on the fly type of situation as well. I uh, I could not be more with you. I will gladly do a full episode of Emmanuel quickly bold predictions next season because I am fully in the tank for that dude as I am fully in the tank for Joey Cash and Pound the Rock. I hope that this can become an annual rite of passage for us, Cash. I know uh, the bold predictions thing has just been ripped from what you guys do at Pound the Rock every year so wonderfully. I'm glad that you've allowed me to co-opt the thing that no other podcast has ever done say, before. Uh, <laughs> and, I was going to say, uh, yeah, we reinvented bold predictions at Pound the Rock. I, I look forward to us leveling up the, uh, the boldness, the heat on our takes next year, and hopefully not being quite as wrong. I promise to not have anything as bad as the Grady Dick Jalen McDaniels thing. An unbelievably stupid thing that I said on this podcast, where I'm ostensibly paid to say smart things about the basketball team. Uh, uh, we're all allowed a couple mulligans a year, I think. Joey Cash, where can people find you? Uh, where can people support your work or anything in particular you want to promote right now? Uh, the usual is uh, make sure you're subscribed to the Score app. Uh, follow my work and Joe Wolfon's work there in the NBA News River. You can find our features. My latest short read feature that should be up by the time people listen to this will be just a 
Uh, a quick read on why I think Zach Eady doesn't necessarily, you know, he's not going to be Yao Ming or an all-star, but he also, that doesn't mean he has to be Boban either. Like there is a sure. middle ground I think he can find where he'll be a solid NBA player. Um, and you can obviously listen to the Pound the Rock podcast wherever you get your podcast and subscribe to the Scores YouTube page where you can find my weekly unfiltered series, kind of a lighthearted deep dive into the NBA's trending topics and i think that covers it all and i will say woodley i wore just for the vibes i wore this i don't know what i think this was from when they came back from the pandemic oh yeah it's we back shirt love it just, that season just put, that was really good right i guess that was season yeah. was good it, yeah that's it they surprised it was 48 games and took the six or six games yeah. but i just i did it for the vibes put those positive vibes out there that the raptors will in some form or fashion be back to relevance at least next season and i don't know what that'll mean in the standings but i think I do think before Scotty got hurt, I think you started to see the Darko vision coming to life with a team and a roster that fit that vision more. Mm -hmm. And you can argue about whether, you know, they needed to make those changes again, the Siakam stuff, and they weren't utilizing him correctly earlier in the year and all that. But with the roster they now have that I think fits the way Darko wants to play, I think you started to see that vision coming into focus right before Scotty got hurt. And I think there's something to build on towards next year. They still need to have a good summer. They need to have mm -hmm. a better overall year than they did last year, but in terms of like roster management and all that. But I think, I think there's a chance that come October, a good chance that come October, we can wear a shirt like this, you know, <laughs> and mean it. And maybe that only means, hey, maybe we back just means ninth place. I don't know. But Honestly, man, it'll be better no, the this. bar I'm hoping to clear next year, get the hashtag going. Hashtag better than the Bulls. It can't be that hard to be better than the Bulls, right? Right? I mean, Please. Uh, yeah, I'm with you. I'm feeling all right about next year, even though this year has been a grim, disgusting mess of a season. Uh, I do think, you know, we talked about quickly, Scotty Barnes rocks. There's lots to like here as well. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, hopefully some positive, optimistic, bold predictions when you join us in October. Hopefully you're on between now and then as well to talk about other stuff. But uh, if not, we will see you then. And thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you, the listeners, for tuning in and subscribing, following, rating, reviewing, all that good stuff. You're much appreciated for all you do to support the show. However it is you support the show, join the Discord. Link in the description. Free to join, as always. Find my work on the Hell website at Woodley Sean. And we will talk to you again on Monday as we recap the final two games of the regular season against the Miami Heat. Uh, will they play spoiler? Do they have any interest in playing spoiler? We'll see. We'll talk about it on Monday. Thanks so much for hanging. Bye-bye.